Yeah, it's really good to see it a second time and on the big screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't mention it particularly, but hopefully it'll come up in the question. Yeah. Yeah. The film yesterday, did it move on to come in there? I mean, this was the question was obvious, was it? They didn't broadcast the film, so it's just the only thing you can see. But that was specifically about how you Hi everyone, um, welcome, uh, welcome back. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers again uh, quite briefly so we can get on with the proceedings and, and just say a little bit about what they've expressed an interest in discussing and hopefully um, some of those points will be of interest to you all as well. Um, we're going to be very disciplined in our timing this evening and, and, and uh, if we have the sense that it's appropriate to open up to questions for the, from the floor sooner rather than later, we'll do so, so that we can have enough time to uh, talk about what needs to be discussed and, and also maybe go back to some of the points that were mentioned yesterday. Um, so, uh, in order of appearance, um, first of all we have uh, Duncan Double, who is a consultant psychiatrist within the Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust and um, also a key member of the Critical Psychiatry Network here in the UK. Um, followed by Angela Woods, uh, interdisciplinary men mental, mental, <laughs> medical, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Ooh, 
um, medical humanities researcher based at uh, Durham University. Um, and finally, Alistair Morgan, um, formerly at the University of Nottingham um, and now a senior lecturer in mental health at Sheffield Hallam. Um, and in, in tonight's discussion, sort of turning towards what uh, the legacies of the discussions around anti-psychiatry um, were at the time of Basalia and, and Lang. Um, some of the points that, that um, the speakers have been interested in discussing are the extent to which um, those discussions created um, clearer understandings of um, mental illness, particularly diagnosis of conditions such as schizophrenia, um, at, within a kind of academic or professional discourse, but also, also kind of within popular understanding um, and also the way in which the movement has lived on um, the way in which it's disavowed within critical psychiatry occasionally or, or, or seen as a kind of negative term but also um, the way in which it can be associated with um, user and survivor movements which I know there was a, that was a point that was raised yesterday and um, the speakers have, have kind of raised that something I'd be interested in discussing. Um, so I'm going to hand over uh, straight away to Duncan um, and then we'll just uh, have the chain of presentations and then the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you to uh, Isabel for uh, organising these uh, these two evenings. I thought yesterday was uh, was very successful, and I, I hope we were able to have a a, a good good discussion this evening as well. Um, as uh, as Isabel says, I'm a member of the Critical Psychiatry Network, which is a small group of. Uh, British psychiatrists um, who are prepared to be uh, critical of their own profession, which uh, in some ways is, is unusual in psychiatry. Um, and we've been going since, 19, uh, since 1999, and um, I, now, uh, I now do a blog called, uh, called Critical Psychiatry. And um, I've got uh, just a short presentation, actually. Um, just a, a ten minute presentation, so um, if you'll allow me to um, to get through that and then the other two can uh, do their presentation and we can have a have a discussion um, and I'm picking up from uh, from the film which uh, I guess most of you have uh, have seen, which was uh, um, and I'm talking about uh, understanding psychosis. So um, I want to start by um, by looking at R.D. Leng's first book, The Divided Self, which was uh, first published in 1960. And Leng was uh, one of the best-known psychiatrists of modern times, in many ways, and uh, was seen as uh, one of the main uh, protagonists of anti-psychiatry. I suppose the other was uh, Thomas Sass. Leng said, I wrote this book when I was 28. I wanted to convey above all that it was far more possible than is generally supposed to understand people diagnosed as psychotic. So this was his main motivation for, for writing The Divided Self. Psychosis may be difficult to understand, but it needs time, skill, and compassion to try to understand it. And Ling was uh, seen as different from other psychiatrists. In his words, I failed to develop the feeling I had a medical mission to stop people against their will from feeling the way they did. Instead, I wanted to create a space where people could be treated by me, if they wanted to be treated by me, in completely different ways, in many respects the opposite ways from those in which I'd been trained to treat them. 
he may not have uh, succeeded in this aim, but I do think it is important to try to understand psychosis. To use an example from Leng, that little old lady, tears streaming down her face, on her knees, wringing her hands, lips moving, no words uttered, pleading. There's no one there. Now she's listening. There's no one there. Is she an hallucinating psychotic in the locked ward of a mental hospital? Is she saying her prayers in a cathedral? She could be the same person. The term antipsychiatry was coined by Leng's uh, one-time colleague, David Cooper. And as uh, Isabel said, Leng himself never accepted the uh, designation of himself. In some ways, antipsychiatry is difficult to define, and I'm sure we'll have some discussion about that. It was a catch-all term for connecting some radical ideas and individuals. In fact, it's always been defined more by mainstream psychiatry to mark out its opposition than by the identified protagonists themselves. So how does mainstream psychiatry try to understand psychosis? As an example, I want to quote from an editorial in the British Medical Journal entitled Understanding Schizophrenia. It says, research is proliferating and providing ever more evidence of organic dysfunction in psychosis. This means that schizophrenia is a brain problem. So to reiterate, the article goes on, few would now dispute that a substantial proportion of patients with schizophrenia do indeed have consistent structural and physiological brain abnormalities. So mainstream psychiatry focuses on the brain. However, I want to suggest that the current dominance of this biological view blocks the view of the patient as a person. In fact, knowledge of the brain may give no understanding of the person. For example, it's uh, very common for psychiatrists to believe that patients diagnosed as having a mental illness have a chemical imbalance in the brain. This view is transmitted to the public so that there's widespread acceptance of this hypothesis. In fact, most of the evidence is against this view, and people are often surprised when they're told this. But I don't want to go into the evidence in this talk. Instead, I want to make a more general point about the problem of focusing on the brain. But just to be clear, though, I'm not saying that psychosis has nothing to do with the brain. Of course, psychosis has its origins in the brain. However, making such a statement does not provide any understanding of the reasons for mental health problems. In fact, reducing mental disorder to a causal statement about brain pathology avoids ascribing any meaning to such action. People are not the same as their brains. Perhaps the way to describe what I'm saying is that psychosis shows through the brain, but not necessarily in the brain. And I'm not saying it's necessarily easy to understand psychosis. In fact, it may be very difficult to make sense of some people with psychosis. They may have symptoms including bizarre beliefs or delusions, unusual experiences such as hallucinations, and their thought may be difficult to follow and be disordered. 
because they may be difficult to understand, the temptation is then to say that this is because of an abnormality in the brain. Whereas actually what might really be needed is even more effort to try and understand why they are expressing themselves in such a way. As Isabel said, uh, Bogman Pam Jagua actually has a website and it does expand on, uh, on what we saw in the film. He makes it clear that uh, I faced both the systems police and the private police in the medical blood sport and came to recognize that both were dangerous. The systems police are under the control of the worldwide criminal empire of the system and are its enforcing arm, doing a lot of the system's dirty work for it. They are my enemy. But as a conservationist, I came to recognize they were the enemies of the human race and of life on Earth. The private police are equally dangerous and under the control of goodness knows who. This may be seen as one of the dis disjointed ramblings of someone with a disordered mind. However, the website also gives indications that he understands his predicament. So to quote again, I was just living a quiet, uh, I was just a quiet living countryman trying to find some peace and quiet in remote country areas, but never found it. And he goes on. I lived through a series of disturbing events and then became distrustful of others and retreated into nature. And as a psychiatrist, I've seen enough uh, people with this reaction to life to know that they tend to continue in this state. So it may not make that much difference to his condition. As Bogman himself says, I've been off also called schizophrenia medication for 37 years after some was forced on me for a few months in 1975 and I was said to need it for the rest of my life. So in conclusion, psychiatry should offer understanding of people's difficulties. And I'm not saying it doesn't do this, but it does need to change its emphasis. In the words of Diana Rose, the culture of psychiatry has to change so that people are not treated as cases or instances of categories, but as people with hopes, fears, and aspirations which need to be dealt with on a human level. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody, and um, thank you so much to Isabel for the invitation to be here. Um, and thank you so much to last night's speakers as well, and to the fact that this is being streamed on the internet. It's the first academic event I'd ever watched, or public event, or any event really, live streamed. It felt very exciting. So I thought I'd say a special hello to anyone watching live over the internet. Um, and if you are on Twitter, please um, tell us what you think and, and ask questions and get engaged using the hashtag antipsych. Um, so, so far, I think, across, um, across the various presentations, both last night and also some of the things Duncan's been talking about, we've been thinking, I guess, about some of the clinical legacies of the anti-psychiatry movement or movements um, from the 1960s and 70s. But of course, part of the very logic of those movements was to question ideas of the clinical um, and to question the place of madness within the clinic. So I put that in inverted commas just in quickly recapping some of the, the main things that I think that, that live on um, as far as key ideas from anti-psychiatry in a very general way. And the first, as Duncan's just described, is this idea of the understandability of mad experience. I think this is fundamental to R.D. Lang's early work, as, as Duncan's already mentioned, and that it's, it's really talking about a, um, an understandability that is 
approaching the person rather than uh, rather than the kind of biological end, un entity. So it's an understandability that is accessible both to people themselves, to the families, to their wider communities, not just to professionals. And I think that sense of, of who can understand is something that was obviously pivotal to the anti-psychiatry movement. A second thing that I think antipsychiatrists definitely emphasised were the social origins of madness. Madness becomes understandable when you view people as people in the context of their families and their relationships, in the context of the, the communities and the broader civilization in which they live. This focus on not just the brain or the isolated body or underlying, underlying realms of pathology is something that I think is definitely powerful and lives on. And finally, we heard a lot last night about the antipsychiatric critique of the maddening effects of psychiatry, that some of the things done in the name of psychiatric care and medical care, um, the kind of juridical power of psychiatry, have in themselves caused deep suffering and damage and can on occasion lead to all sorts of things rather too easily dismissed as side effects but nonetheless have, have caused real and, and genuine distress for a lot of people. But what I want to talk about tonight um, is the legacy of antipsychiatry in a different sphere. And it's, it's in some ways an arbitrary distinction to divide the clinical and the cultural realms. But bear with me and we'll see how far we get with that. Um, so I'm thinking about the basically the impact of antipsychiatry within a broader countercultural movement of the 60s and 70s and how that went on in all sorts of academic contexts particularly to ignite all sorts of discussions and debate around both the nature of madness but also the nature of what it means to be a subject living in kind of late capitalist post-modernity. So for the purposes or from an academic perspective, antipsychiatry has these four kind of major intellectual pillars in the, in the kind of Anglo-American world. Um, Thomas Sars, R.D. Lang, Irvin Goffman and Michel Foucault. And as we've all, I think, announced in our presentations, all of them reject the term anti-psychiatry. So in some ways there's this kind of persistent academic violence in, in constantly calling them anti-psychiatrists, which I confess I'm going to hear partake of. Um, Saz has a particularly eloquent disavowal of the term. He says, I reject the term anti-psychiatry because it's imprecise, misleading and cheaply self-aggrandizing. In my book, The Sublime Object of Psychiatry, Schizophrenia and Clinical and Cultural Theory, which I hasten to mention that I'm mentioning not in an effort to be cheaply self-aggrandizing, um, but rather as a way of, of kind of, I guess, explaining, if not trying to justify, why the rest of my talk is going to focus specifically on schizophrenia. And it struck me as, as a fascinating um, aspect of the conversation that happened last night, that schizophrenia was barely mentioned in the presentations. Yet, when you come from the perspective of thinking about schizophrenia, anti-psychiatry seems crucially engaged with this very contested and still contestable term. So these texts that I've mentioned interrogated and ultimately rejected on various different grounds and from various different disciplinary perspectives and ethical perspectives and kind of existential perspectives, rejected mainstream psychiatries and also psychoanalytic count, accounts of psychosis and of schizophrenia specifically. But they also changed popular perceptions by repositioning the schizophrenic patient as a key protagonist in the political arena not just in the fight necessarily around asylums and the future of, of kind of psychiatric services, but, but in, a, in a much larger kind of context. So we've seen that anti-psychiatry movements varied widely in their political objectives and they varied across national contexts. But I would like to suggest that anti-psychiatry's anti -psychiatry prominence within broader countercultural movements of the 60s and 70s, which gave this figure of the schizophrenic such a potent symbolic charge. And I hasten to add that the, the figure of the schizophrenic could not be in more quotation marks in the way that I'm using it. But it's a term that gets charged in an antipsychiatric writing and that despite the fact we may now see this as a kind of an abomination, as a, as a kind of an ontologizing of, um, of something that may not even exist as a highly stigmatizing term, it had a symbolic role in that period that got picked up and contested and itself moved on in all sorts of interesting ways. 
The historians Postel and Allen, for example, write that the schizophrenic, along with those other symbolic figures, women, homosexuals, low-paid workers, prisoners and army conscripts, became part of the oppressed, more broadly speaking, taking on a potent role as society's ultimate underdog. So this is, this is something that's seen in revolutionary um, the approaches to therapy and therapeutic practice, in the texts that I've just mentioned, but also in a range of different events. And again, it seems to me that, that there's a kind of, um, probably the most famous and the most well-known, is the 1967 Congress, a two-week Congress in London on the dialectics of liberation. Um, this was a... a Key presenters and kind of contributors to the dialectics of liberation were what has been described as an all male star studded left wing lineup of um, academics, economists, psychiatrists, political activists, literary critics, good we got in there somewhere, anthropologists, sociologists, theatrical directors, and Buddhist monks. Stokely Carmichael, Herbert Marcuse, and Allen Ginsberg, and of course, Artie Lang, most famously among them. But bookending perhaps this kind of high point in British anti-psychiatry in terms of its, its popular perception is the Schizoculture Convention of 1975 held at Columbia University in New York. This event was attended by hundreds, including Jean-Francois Lyotard, Michel Foucault, William Burroughs, Deleuze, Guattari, a whole range of different artists, activists and philosophers who, among other things, were there in an eclectic, exuberant celebration of schizophrenia's radical potential. And I think it's interesting that in just the last two years, that these events have become brought back to public attention, that there's, there's archive projects dedicated to try to seek out the testimonies and, and stories of people who attended these events, and I guess to reflect on their legacy some 30, 35 years later. So to, to kind of summarise in, in a fairly crude and quick fashion, we could say that in denouncing the role that psychiatry played in furthering what was perceived as an advanced capitalist agenda, Anti-psychiatrists or people identified with this movement across Europe and America mobilised this figure of the schizophrenic either as the apotheosis of the oppressed, an exemplary militant in the fight against capitalism, or as a figurehead for psychic, social and political emancipation. So the first legacy then of anti-psychiatry could be seen to be, in this cultural sphere, a kind of Dionysian schizophrenia for the capitalist or postmodern age. And this is, I think, perhaps one of its most contested legacies. I think this is something that, that a lot of people want to be as distanced from as, as they possibly can. This kind of Dionysian schizophrenia is perhaps most famously articulated in Lang's 1967 book, The Politics of Experience, which is a clear departure from some of his early work in many respects. He writes in that book, future generations, quote, will see that what we call schizophrenia was one of the forms in which, often through quite ordinary people, the light began to break, began to break through the cracks in our all too closed minds. And he goes on, can we not see that this voyage is not what we need to be cured of, but that is its, it, is, it is itself a natural way of healing our own appalling state of alienation called normality? So schizophrenia here is, is framed very much as a breakthrough rather than a breakdown, as a kind of voyage into inner space, a, a kind of transcendent flight away from the horrors of a particularly alienating sort of Western civilization that, that around this time is, is locked into the Vietnam War. There are moments in the politics of experience where Lang is cautious and seeks to qualify this perspective, but they're not what endures about people's remembrance of this text. Rather, it's this kind of idealised, romanticised vision of schizophrenia, which seems to have had a huge popular appeal at the time. So Peter Sedgwick, writing in 1992, says, by the early 1970s, quote, Virtually the entire left and an enormous proportion of the liberal arts and social studies reading public, I think that's a very telling remark, um, was convinced that R.D. Lang and his band of colleagues had produced novel and essentially accurate readings of what psychotic experience truly signified. And of course, that, that sense of a small, elite, sort of highly educated left-wing audience is, is, I think, you know, obviously not 
we can't say that that's the entirety of civilization, nor can we say that that's necessarily people in positions of clinical power. But I think in some senses it's, it's easy to forget perhaps just the enormous popula popularity of those um, perceptions. And this very much filtered through in an academic context, um, both Lang's work itself, but also this um, extraordinary book, one of the most notorious philosophical texts of the late 20th century. Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia is, is, a, is a joint project between Giles Deleuze, the French philosopher, and the Italian activist Félix Guattari. And it was, I think, as Ian Buchanan has so beautifully put it, an intellectual cluster bomb lobbed into the fray of 1968 French theory. Deleuze and Guattari were both inspired by and critical of figures like Lang and Basalia and others in the, in the anti-psychiatric movement. And theirs is a much less mystical but no less reimagining of schizophrenia. Deleuze and Guattari seem to wrestle schizophrenia out of a discourse of disease and dysfunction and deterioration and see it instead as capturing something of the truth of desire. For them, it's a process of psychic and social deterritorialization that's unleashed by capitalism. It's capitalism's deepest tendency, therefore, but because of this constant drive to deterritorialization, it's also its absolute limit, its difference, its divergence, and its death. So these thinkers who were all in the orbit of anti-psychiatry created the space to see schizophrenia very differently and to understand its relationship to the specific structures of the capitalist West. This leads us to a kind of second legacy that, that is getting further away from the kind of core texts and core ideas of antipsychiatry, perhaps, but that I think is almost unthinkable without it. Had antipsychiatry never happened, I think there's a whole arm of this kind of intellectual work, certainly that's been very powerful in, in my field of literary and cultural studies and medical humanities, that simply couldn't have played out in the way that it did. So we have here schizophrenia undergoing in symbolic terms in these, these kind of discourses a further change in the 1980s and 90s. And this is most famously produced by the work of American literary Marxist critic, Marxist literary critic, probably more a conventional way of putting it, um, whose 1984 essay, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, offered the vision of schizophrenia as a kind of characteristic pathology of the postmodern. So he has a, a clear but unacknowledged debt to Deleuze and Guattari and in turn to perhaps even back to Adi Lang. But he proposed that schizophrenia or the figure of the schizophrenic was both a product and a symptom of specific changes in contemporary society. What he was doing in this move was to try and interpret certain changes in the structure of experience for us all. So it's a very kind of totalizing theory in many respects, but it's an effort to understand a kind of fragmentation of our experience of time, a fragmentation in, in our general language, in our sense of agency, in our sense of identity. And schizophrenia becomes a way in, as his argument maps out, to connect these to very specific material changes in the late 20th century. Changes relating to globalization, um, miniaturization, computing, to the rapid cycles of consumer culture, to the so-called ecstasy of communication in an information age. So pulsing with a mysterious, unnameable force, he writes, postmodernity produces in its subjects the paradoxical experience of feeling both unreal and extra-real at the same time. So this is clearly a kind of reaching at the bounds of a, of a metaphoric use of the term schizophrenia. And Jamison thought it was basically kind of tacky to think that the schizophrenia he was writing about had anything to do with the schizophrenia that, that routinely psychiatrists would be encountering and that people would be receiving as a diagnosis. But the fact that his argument is so strongly dependent on psychoanalytic and autobiographical accounts of schizophrenia has led me at least to question how neatly these things can be divided. It's hard to overstate, too, the influence and popularity of this one article, which, fast forward to 30 years, has been cited over 11,000 times, which may not be much in science, but in the humanities, that's totally out there. So Jamison wasn't alone in seeing schizophrenia as a kind of paradigmatic pathology of the postmodern. There was Jean Baudrillard, David Harvey, Mark Curie, John Johnston, Stephen Frosch. This territory has been explored from all sorts of different perspectives in all sorts of disciplines. 
But I think what's interesting is that it, it, it now, in a contemporary sense, has faded from view for a number of reasons. I think there's, broadly speaking, a greater, a greater sense of the dangers inherent in using illness as metaphor to hark back to Susan Sontag's work. I think there's been a shift in people's perceptions of the crises in subjectivity that schizophrenia was being used to diagnose. And there have been other key concepts and ideas that have perhaps displaced a focus on pathology within the humanities and social sciences. So for example, a turn to affect and emotion, a kind of reclaiming of the body, um, a focus on memory and the study of trauma. I think these things have been perceived as being more productive and, and sort of useful than, than clinging on to this idea of, of a kind of characteristic, um, characteristic pathology. Um, it's also true, as you all have noticed in my presentation, that these, this idea, this totalizing view of schizophrenia doesn't get us very far in examining questions of difference, particularly around gender and race. And one thing we haven't brought out in the discussions of antipsychiatry, although it was alluded to, I think, by John Foote in his presentation, is the sort of status of women within this movement. Certainly a, a number of its key protagonists and intellectual architects all come from, from a, a very, shall we say, specific perspective. Um, the final thing that I, well, I also wondered, and this harks back to, to, Doug, to Duncan's point, of the extent to which this a turn towards neuroscience also in some ways eclipses a kind of interest in schizophrenia, that we're much collectively in, more enchanted by, by certain aspects of brain science than we are by, by psychiatry as a dominant kind of explanatory value. But the very last thing I want to talk about, and this is a very brief point, is to think about some of the academic legacies of anti-psychiatry. And this is, this is in a very contemporary context. Um, as I've tried to explain, I think anti-psychiatry opens schizophrenia up, particularly to multiple readings and multiple uses within the cultural sphere. And these have been, I'm not in any way trying to endorse this as an intellectual move, but merely to point out that it happened and that it had very potent effects. But I think thinking beyond this, there are all sorts of ways in which antipsychiatry provided templates for, for thinking and for working that it's quite instructive for contemporary researchers and contemporary, I think, protagonists in the mental health sphere to, to look to and to learn from. So at Durham, I'm the co-director of a project called Hearing the Voice, which is a large three-year interdisciplinary study of voice hearing or auditory verbal hallucinations. And we have a, a team of people from cultural studies through to cognitive neuroscience, from medical humanities to clinical psychology, working as closely as we can with voice hearers, um, psychologists, service users, and other experts by experience. So this, in this project, there are thinking about it in the context of this talk, I was thinking about the things that I feel that I've learned from this study of antipsychiatry and where I think some of the legacies of that way of thinking about and approaching mental distress and human experience live on. And for me, this is them. I think antipsychiatry calls upon us to understand experience fundamentally within the context of people's lives, whether it's, it's kind of um, psychological phenomenology or philosophical phenomenology. There's a sense in which if we're thinking about that, the nuance of experience, understanding context, social context, historical context is of vital importance. I think there's also a caution not to assume pathology or disease, not to use these as the, as the frameworks through which one approaches experience in the first instance. Not that they can be jettisoned entirely or that it would necessarily be desirable to do so, but not to start from the idea that people are inherently pathological or inherently suffering from some kind of organic disease process. Antipsychiatrists, as much as they're, they're pilloried in all sorts of contexts, were, I think, quite, quite good at drawing in a range of different kinds of expertise. There were philosophers, there were Marxists, there were activists, there were um, academics from all sorts of different disciplinary dis discourses. So it's a kind of hybridized, pluralistic endeavor in so many ways, where all sorts of clinical and scholarly um, conversations clashed in, I think, quite productive ways. But crucially, I think antipsychiatry pushes us beyond an academic conversation and beyond a strictly clinical conversation. It draws in, it encourages us rather to draw in artists and crucially to draw in people themselves. That idea of empowering people to contribute to the wealth of understanding around experiences that they themselves are the experts in. And finally, I think 
I certainly find anti-psychiatry a call to remember that, that this work and these endeavours, as, as much as they may have scholarly aims and outcomes, as much as they may influence disciplines, in some ways are all about ultimately making a difference to people's lives. And that sense of, of that kind of commitment, that ethics and that politics of anti-psychiatry, even if one doesn't necessarily agree with some of the more radical Maoist positions or some of the kind of more extremist um, views within the movements, there's a sense, I think, of the idea that making a difference is, is a really crucial endeavour. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, my talk is called uh, Not Like That, Not For That, Not By Them, The Disavowal of Anti-Psychiatry. Um, and the argument I'm going to present is uh, an argument about uh, a particular disavowal of anti-psychiatry. Um, and that disavowal involves a construction of what anti-psychiatry was. Um, I'm using the term disavowal to mean a, a disclaim, disclaiming of knowledge of, responsibility for, or association with. But of course a disavowal in some sense is a, an acknowledgement of some kind of association. So you, you refuse that association by disavowing it. Um, and I particularly want to talk about a disavowal of anti-psychiatry by a strand of, of critical psychiatry. Um, I'm going to talk um, mostly about some of the work of um, Phil Thomas and Pat Bracken and, and also a little bit about Nicholas Rosen. It, it, in, a, in a short talk, it'll involve a little bit of conflation of two positions, and I apologize for that. Um, but because both of these positions do depend on a reading of Foucault, um, then that conflation is a little bit justified. But if it's a bit crude, then I do apologize in advance. So this disavowal involves a construction of anti-psychiatry and a construction of what the tasks are for critical psychiatry. So the first half of the talk is, is uh, an account of this construction of what anti-psychiatry was and the construction of what a proper critical psychiatry is that surpasses anti-psychiatry. And then I want to um, return to Basaglia and try to critically rescue some elements of anti-psychiatry and ask some questions about what it might mean to negate the power of psychiatry today. So this is the argument about what anti-psychiatry was. This is the kind of argument from this strand of critical psychiatry. So anti-psychiatry was a humanist um, project. So it was based on some kind of foundational view of what it me meant to be human. And it viewed power as a, some kind of repression and domination of humanity. It viewed power as a repression and domination of, of, in, of the individual. So anti-psychiatry was concerned with freeing the individual's potential from uh, the repression and domination of power. Uh, and largely anti-psychiatry was a, a, an Anglo-American affair. So largely anti-psychiatry is constructed as some kind of combination of, of Zass, Lang, Cooper. Um, so um, the tradition that we, we concentrated on quite a lot last night, and one of the, the great things about this event is, is thinking about the tradition, I, I really hesitate to term it continental anti-psychiatry because it kind of resurrects, uh, you know, a kind of um, a division from philosophy that we probably don't want to resurrect in some ways, but I've done it, so there it goes. Um, these are the, the three questions of anti-psychiatry, according to this construction of what anti-psychiatry was. Is there a legitimate role for doctors in working with those with mental distress? Does medicine have anything to contribute in working with mental distress? Seem like similar questions, actually. Is the term mental illness valid? And of course, anti-psychiatry is going to say no to all of these questions, ultimately. So anti-psychiatry, and, and these are many of the things that we talked about last night, was structured by a kind of triptych and this is uh, this is taken from um, Miller and Rose's book uh, from the mid-1980s called The Power of Psychiatry. 
So anti-psychiatry was concerned with the asylum uh, and the, the power of the asylum. And power here was seen as um, exclusion, coercion, repression, domination, and violence. So it was a refusal of the institution. Uh, as Angela has just pointed out, um, in her talk, uh, anti-psychiatry was very much concerned with the experience of madness. Um, what madness was, the possibilities lying within madness, the possibility of a madness beyond psychiatry. And anti-psychiatry was, was concerned with the concept of medicalization, or perhaps we could, we could also think about the concept of reification. How human experiences are reduced to biomedical objects. So the way that human processes and social processes are turned into things, and the objects of pharmacology and suppressed through the use of pharmacology. Now the way that critical psychiatry surpasses anti-psychiatry first is through a Copernican turn from madness as the object um, of interest to um, mental health care and the disciplines of mental health and their practices of producing selves. So rather than focusing on subjective experiences of madness, we focus on the various discourses, practices, disciplines of psychiatry and mental health more broadly, and how those disciplines produce subjectivities. And those disciplines do not produce subjectivities just in terms of pathology. So there's a move to focusing on concepts of health rather than just illness, concepts of health as well as illness. How do these disciplines of, of psychiatry and mental health produce ideas of what it means to be healthy as well as what it means to be ill. So here we have a concern with the productive or positive concept of power. Now the idea of a productive or positive concept of power shouldn't mean necessarily that it's good. I mean productive or positive doesn't mean that it's good, it just means that it's kind of producing different effects. Power is not just seen as repression or domination. Um, and it's a change in the role of critique. So critique is, the role that critique takes towards psychiatry is not revolutionary. It's not, whatever you might think of anti-psychiatry and its role in relation to psychiatry, in some ways psychiatry was really at stake in the anti-psychiatric discourse. Whether psychiatry would survive was certainly put at stake. Um, we may want to discuss whether, whether you think that's true or not, but I, I would say that it, it, it is true for a lot of anti-psychiatrists. Um, whereas critique here is seen as complementary rather than re revolutionary. And sometimes critique is seen as a very kind of more modest project of actually trying to map certain ways of viewing the world rather than actually critiquing. There's also a sense of a, of a new paradigm in biology and biological medicine that's non-reductive. So rather than seeing our... Um, biological underpinnings are some kind of fate that could be expressed in terms of an expression of illness. There's a, an idea of um, biological susceptibilities that might express themselves and might not and interact in various ways with society. And that this new biological paradigm changes the nature of what a critique of psychiatry should be. So this is a quote from um, Bracken and Thomas's book, Post Psychiatry. So psychiatry, psychiatric power operates not, not solely, but uh, in, in important ways to produce an enhanced notion of subjectivity, an expanded sense of selfhood through the production of new discourses of the self. So a very different way of thinking about psychiatry and psychiatry, um, psychiatric power is not just there to coerce and repress people's subjectivities, it produces subjectivities and it produces expanded senses of selfhood. Um, Nicholas Rose has talked um, in, in a number of articles and books um, in the last 10 years about a, a new paradigm of, of subjective experience. Um, and this is a, you know, a way that he's kind of mapping a different way that we view ourselves. Um, so a move away from a concern with depth and a concern with meaning and uh, towards a more surface understanding of the self. Uh, a way of kind of managing ourselves and producing our choices and producing our moods. Distress here is no longer seen as the repository of deep meaning, but an expression of maladaptive coping, faulty patterns of thinking, 
or neurochemical misfirings. Um, perhaps the most interesting, one of the most interesting books that kind of launches this way of thinking is Peter Kramer's book on Prozac, listening to Prozac, which is a kind of an interesting book and not, I mean, sometimes portrayed as a very kind of reductive book, but it's, it's a bit more interesting than that and where kind of Peter Kramer kind of uh, gives case vignettes from his work about how people are kind of using Prozac for normality, you know, not to treat depression, but to lead more normal lives, uh, and how kind of the use of Prozac enables them to be their real self. Um, it would be a mistake to say that kind of Bracken and Thomas, uh, I mean, I think Rose's recent work is kind of interesting in that it's very neutral as to these um, changes. I mean, Bracken and Thomas are, are still do insist on a fundamental concern with meaning as part of the project of critical psychiatry. Furthermore, you know, they're very critical of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but still, it's quite interesting that there's a refusal to critique a superficial concept of experience. So here they kind of are talking about these new concepts of subject experience. And they seem to, they kind of bookend this little, little paragraph by saying, we're neither for nor against the emergence of post-modernity and its new narratives of the self. And this kind of final refusal of critique is quite an interesting move in a lot of kind of critical work around psychiatry. Well, in a lot of critical work at the moment, maybe not just around psychiatry. Um, Nicholas Rose has talked about this concept of neurochemical selfhood. Um, so um, one way of thinking about this change in understanding our own experiences is to think about ourselves as neurochemical selves. And again, Angela kind of referred a little bit to this at the end of her talk in, in the reference to neuroscience. Um, and for Rose, um, these are the kind of five aspects to neurochemical selfhood. So life is conceived at a molecular level in terms of the coding of sequences of genes. As we saw before, there is a move from pathology towards wellness and health. And there's a dialectic of susceptibility and enhancement in managing on and working on the molecular or neurochemical level. So um, I may have a kind of biological susceptibility to some kind of distress, um, but that biological susceptibility might not express itself. You know, in psychiatry, you know, people are talking a lot about biomarkers. And um, I will work on that biological susceptibility, but not by kind of taking drugs necessarily to suppress that or to deal with some putative disease entity, but I might take something to actually enhance other aspects of myself to work on it. Uh, and so neurochemical selfhood works with this kind of dialectic of susceptibility and enhancement. Um, and this produces what sounds very much like a kind of liberal, liberal concept of subjectivity. So I get kind of choices in how to live, manipulate and create myself, but not through the deep project of meaning, but through a kind of working on my biology, particularly in sort of chemical ways. And, and Rose has this very nice term for how I'll work on it in consultation with what he calls the pastors of the soma. So the pastors of the soma are my kind of psychiatric experts, or they might be my life coaches, or my, they might even be you know, pharmaceutical companies that I can then go and kind of work on and consult with to, to create some chemicals to produce some pleasant effects. Uh, Rose, of course, interestingly, does talk about an economics that's attached to this vitality in terms of pharmaceuticals. Yeah. So Rose is, is aware that this is you know, taking place in a capitalist economy and that an economics and a value attached to, to this production of emotional life. The point of critique here is to engage with this new paradigm and not to resist it. So critique here is a kind of form of mapping. This is what's happening. This is what's out there. This is what we're increasingly becoming. Let's think about how we work with this, how we map the different spaces, what kind of selves this is producing. Um, but we don't, we don't resist it. Um, this is an interesting article, and it's a very good article by uh, somebody called Jan Slaby, um, and he's part of a project called Critical Neuroscience. But this is very representative of what critique means here. So he's very clear about what critique must not be. It must not be linked to radical projects, out-of-date systems of thought. It must not be broadly anti-scientific, neo-romantic, and hostile to any form of productive engagement. This leads to a kind of postmodern pragmatism. So whether mental illness exists or not is an empty question. 
So critical psychiatry and Bracken and Thomas write that, you know, it's an empty question. I don't really understand why it's an empty question. Whether mental ex illness exists or not is an empty question. So it's not concerned with the definition of illness. Critical psychiatry does not oppose power with the banner of truth. And what it is about is a challenge to any group, and uh, they do specifically say any group that claims to speak exclusively. Um, so it's a kind of challenge to authority in the name of pluralism. Kind of, uh, quite different from anti-psychiatry in that sense. Um, so critical psychiatry could complement and democratize psychiatry, rejuvenate psychiatry. It is not necessarily an antagonist to um, various developments, but we could see um, you know, various developments such as values-based practice or developments like recovery, which has come from the service user movement and then kind of entered the mainstream. And we can also see new developments in psychopharmacology, and perhaps we can see these as things that are not necessarily kind of contradictory. Still, there is a radical remainder of anti-psychiatry in the critique of the influence of the pharmaceutical industry, in an establishment of a medical discourse about mental suffering that is sensitive to meaning, because this is central to what Bracken and Thomas are saying, uh, that they want a medical discourse that is sensitive to meaning. So, I mean, it seems peculiar that they kind of argue against that at some levels, but there is a, still a centrality to this idea of understanding and meaning there. And the promotion of partnership with the user movement. I mean, the idea of kind of undermining any authority then means what kind of section of the user movement do you then pick? I mean, I would imagine that critical psychiatry would partner itself with a radical section of the user movement, but then you kind of are already staking out positions. So. Again, there seems some contradictions in the theoretical position and some of the actual practice there. Okay, so in the final bit, I just want to think a little bit about some of these, this construction of what anti-psychiatry was, and to think a little bit about Bazaglia and what we heard about yesterday and why these positions on anti-psychiatry maybe could be viewed a little bit differently. So to think about a different anti-psychiatry. I don't think what anti-psychiatry was doing in Bazaglia's terms was necessarily the idea of some kind of foundational question of the human. But it was the idea that the asylum and that the question of madness raises the question of what it might mean to be human in this society. The distress caused and the possibilities foreclosed. So the question of what it means to be human in a particular society is linked to the question of madness. And that's one of the interesting things about the anti-psychiatry movement is the kind of question of what it means to be human as a revolutionary question becomes linked to the question of madness at a particular time. Madness is seen as a, an optic for thinking about this question. But it's not a definitive question of what the human is. So Bazaglia talks about a threefold inquiry into the human. What is important is to become aware of who this individual is for me. Who is this person? How can I understand them? What social, social reality is he living in? Um, what is his existence like in the asylum? What is his existence like in front of me as a psychiatrist? And what is his relation to that reality? And this is where the kind of question of power as, as inequality, domination, repression comes in. The relation to that reality is a relation of kind of exclusion, of lack of rights, of precariousness, of vulnerability, of exposure. But awareness is not enough, but a first stage to seeing the therapeutic act as political. So the therapeutic act becomes political by creating a space for contradictions to arise within clinical work through a negation of the power of psychiatry. So the, the therapeutic act is an attempt to negate the power of psychiatry. Um, the interesting operation is by, it's by a psychiatrist. Yeah, that's the kind of paradox and maybe the flaw and something that we could talk about. But um, the attempt is to, is to, to put, the, put psychiatry out of operation in some sense. And we heard from speakers yesterday evening about some of the ways that this happened. I mean, this great story about 
the declaration that all of these people in the hospital are well and we just closed the hospital. Yeah. We have no, no more need for the hospital. It's the most kind of radical example of that. But also the example of the assemblies, the meetings, the example of physically destroying the institution, the examples of destroying hierarchies between patients and staff and amongst the staff. The idea of negation is the idea to create a space where contradictions in society arise. And those contradictions are about a space where people realize that the health system does not correspond to their needs. This is the kind of end stage of therapy, the idea that the system doesn't correspond to your needs. So the work of negation is a refusal of being governed a refusal to allow the smooth functioning of the system and the opening of spaces by finding holes and putting out of action the power of psychiatry. So this is not a claim that there's some kind of fundamental rational point uh, or normative point from which I'm criticizing psychiatry. Nor is it a claim to know exactly what the reality of madness or mental illness is. It's not a claim to know the truth of what it means to be human or the truth of what it means to resist power. It is a claim, though, that the social whole must be comp comprehended as affecting mental distress through a logic of exclusion and violence. And that la the larger social injustices and material inequalities of capitalist society are determinative and foundational for any comprehension of the current social situation of mental distress. And Bazaglia talks about this in terms of bracketing. He takes this concept from phenomenology and applies it in a very different way. Um, and bracketing means kind of putting to one side the understanding of mental illness, but not in the sense of just dismissing the question as a question that can't be resolved or an empty question. But bracketing means that first of all, the first thing that we do is to try and bring to light the social situation of distress in its confrontation with psychiatric power as social power. In the name of what concept of society or humanity is only opened up through this political struggle, through a therapeutic act that is at the same time a political struggle that opens up the question of society or humanity. It doesn't presume the question of what humanity is before it starts. Therefore, maybe in terms of a critical psychiatry, we can rescue an element of anti-psychiatry and resist just an empty invocation of the positivity of power. And we could pay more attention to the forms of power and their overlapping and intertwining effects. Yes, um, power produces subjectivities, power produces choices, but in a context of inequality and exploitation and um, differentials in power and domination. And power continues to operate a force of violence and domination even within its mode of enhancement and positivity. And this is perhaps the kind of the difference in terms of the, the context between anti-psychiatry and the present day in that um, power is very much a, a power which is about thinking through health and enhancement and positivity. But the kind of health, the kind of idea of health that is produced is also a form of domination, a form of violence, the kind of health that we're supposed to aim for. Um, David Ingleby, uh, uh, kind of uh, in the early 80s, um, wrote a, an essay on critical psychiatry. And, and Ingleby's position was that, that um, anti-psychiatry, critical psychiatry, whatever we want to call it, was really a protest of, against reification and positivism. So it was a protest against the turning of human processes into things that could then be measured, quantified, and treated according to the diktats of medical science. Um, and I think these concepts of reification and positivism in contemporary mental health care still have a lot of resonance. So we can think of um, a whole series of things that um, consist of the current concepts of mental health care in the UK that can still be thought of in terms of reification and positivism. Drugs that produce health and illness. Um, I was reading in the, the Guardian the other day, it's an example that I've used before about these kind of love drugs. So 
the argument, the idea that you can um, um, have uh, some oxytocin in a little spray and sniff a bit of oxytocin and sit down and have an empathic chat with your partner and it will kind of mean that you'll have a, a good relationship because uh, you can put yourself in a good mood to have a kind of lengthy chat with somebody by sniffing a bit of empathy spray. And that's a kind of idea of a sort of drug for health. Um, but of course that's a kind of reification of, of something very complex and deep-seated. Um, the proliferation of diagnoses, the medicalization and occlusion of suffering, so suffering is not allowed to appear, um, the dominance of cognitivist concepts of experience, um, so you can change your reality by changing your thoughts, the continuation and extension of psychiatric coercion and violence, so we saw in the uh, Care Quality Commission report the other day that um, sections are increasing. We have a situation in this country where um, since 2008 we've got community treatment orders, so an extension of coercion into the community. Um, so uh, exclusion and psychiatric violence continues. Um, The happiness agenda and the dominance of positive thinking, reduced CBT therapeutic approaches such as behavioral activation, the spiritual emptiness of mindfulness, and the individual vagaries of the recovery approach and its use as a branding exercise by mental health services. So recovery as the kind of Nike swoosh of mental health services. Yeah. So, what is there in kind of anti-psychiatry that we could critically rescue? What is there that could be alive? And I think this is something that many people have talked about over the two days. Um, and maybe this is the idea of a different concept of experience and a tradition within psychiatry, a tradition that uh, was mentioned uh, quite a lot yesterday um, of phenomenological psychiatry, a tradition of writing between the wars in France and Germany of, of um, and it attempts to understand experience, to understand the meaning behind experience. Perhaps more controversially, an idea of kind of psychoanalysis within psychiatry. Maybe people have more negative views of psychoanalysis, but for me, the idea of psychoanalysis, at least broadly, is the idea of something which is not a kind of present or positive concept of experience, but a concept of experience that is kind of uncertain, hidden, not necessarily always present to consciousness. This is not in the name of some kind of fixed humanism, but in the project of becoming something other. And a, a critical rescue of anti-psychiatry in terms of the concept of resistance, and resistance to power and violence. And the raising of the issue of the total irrationality of society as a whole. How inequalities produce mental distress. And perhaps a turn back to madness, and perhaps you know, some of the kind of art and some of the stuff that we talked about is a turn back to madness. But maybe that's problematic. Maybe what, what would a turn back to madness away from a kind of attention to kind of disciplinary power? What would a turn back to the experience of madness really mean? So finally, I want to kind of finish um, with a quote from Michel Foucault. So I'm trying to reclaim Foucault for a politics of resistance. So the critic project um, that maybe we can think about and talk about is what it might mean to negate psychiatric power today. What it might mean, how not to be governed like that, by that, in the name of such and such an objective in mind and by means of such procedures. Not like that, not for that, not by them. Okay. So we're doing quite well, timing-wise. Um, a, a full 50 minutes left for discussion. So I, I don't know if people feel they want to comment immediately, or alternatively, you might have you might have comments to make to each other. If you only have burning comments. Go ahead. Um, does anyone else? It, it might be helpful for other people, just because. Um, sound doesn't always carry without it. Well, thank you again for the three wonderful speakers. I've um, thoroughly enjoyed tonight. I just wanted to pick up, um, <coughs> Alistair, um, on the notions of 
health and well-being, um, and maybe um, a sort of worrying uh, morality that imposes notions of health and well-being. I'm always very interested in the naughty citizens, the ones who make unwise choices. And I think in our present notions of health and well-being, there is an assumption that we are all obedient, while well, I'm afraid a lot of us aren't. Um, I, I, I think that's interesting, and I, I think that some of the, the kind of discourse about... Um, can you hear me all right? There, yeah, because the discourse about kind of measuring happiness, um, and I mean, I, I urge everybody to go out and look at this website called Action for Happiness, and um, to look at, they have a series of posters, and you can kind of look at their posters, and it's like a kind of parody it's like a sort of conceptual art project. It's like a parody of a political movement. It's like somebody's thought, how could we have all of the trappings of a political movement without a single political message in there? Um, and the whole thing is completely empty. You know, uh, you know, a life without meaning has no meaning. They sort of, kind of express that kind of <laughs> tautology. So kind of, I, I've probably misrepresented that. But, um, it's something like that. And it, it, I think the idea of kind of resistance of not being happy, yeah, it's very tempting when you see something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, simply. I, I think uh, the danger of well-being is it's just an, another example of uh, psychiatry not really helping people and not really dealing with with their problems. Um, I mean, that's the that's the danger and. Uh, I mean, that at the moment has extended uh, into the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies uh, Development, IAPT, um, where people are dealt with on the phone, aren't they, quite a bit of the time? There's very, sometimes very little face-to-face -face contact. I think just a, as a footnote that um, broader preoccupation with health ties into, again, something you were talking about, Alistair, that, that Nicholas Rose has, has done some interesting work on, on that, that the mechanisms by which we're encouraged to monitor ourselves. And I've been really intrigued by the proliferation of smartphone apps that are, you know, designed as partly their research tools and partly they're just friendly, helpful ways to, to clock in, you know, every now and then and see on a scale of one to ten how happy am I and how anxious am I and, and you know, be able to plot your mood over a couple of weeks and, I mean, it, uh, one wouldn't want to necessarily dismiss the quantified self as a, as a kind of, um, I don't know, a, a neoliberal conspiracy that's, that's trying radically to subject uh -huh. us and, and actually make us more miserable. I think that would probably be, maybe I'm, I'm not being critical enough, but, but possibly be an extreme case. But, but nonetheless, I think that there is this way in which um, that kind of normative drive towards particular, not just ideals of health, but that active commitment that we seem to be required to have to, to, to sort of foster our own good habits with health all the time. Really beg the question of, of what, what gets left out um, and how people are punished and regulated, the naughty citizens, as you say, but what tolerance we have for, you know, the quotidian unhappiness for on one hand, but also I think a really interesting point that you raised about what tolerance and, and interest do we have in that experience. You know, can we chart a path collectively that isn't, you know, perceived as this kind of naive romanticization, but on the other hand, isn't this this locking out of of really different, interesting, compelling modes of human existence through your smartphone? <laughs> Alistair, can I? I'm, I'm here at the back. Alistair, can I, can I ask you whether you're commending critical psychiatry because it's a real world exercise that's attempting to make a difference to what happens in mainstream mental health services or criticizing it because it's not sufficiently radical a comment upon contemporary capitalist society? I mean, I, I suppose I was trying to raise the question of what would it mean to negate psychiatric power? And I suppose the part of the frustration would be to think about something like um, 
you know, the discourses of kind of recovery that are very predominant in mental health care at the same time when uh, coercion is increasing in mental health care. So we have this kind of dual, kind of this, you know, this idea that, that, mental, that psychiatry is getting more human, but it's getting more coercive. And so, yeah, I was kind of saying it wasn't radical enough. <laughs> yeah, but those are not comments upon critical psychiatry as a project in its own right. Those are comments upon mainstream psychiatric practice. Yeah, I, I mean, I was interested in this argument, this, this kind of argument that um, uh, Phil Thomas and Pat Bracken had kind of laid out and trying to think about the way that they were using this concept of, of power and trying to think about that, that argument that's very kind of coherently laid out and thinking about how there's problems with that for the idea of critique, what critique is. So that's why I was kind of linking it to a, a strand of critical psychiatry. I mean, you're saying Pat and Phil are not uh, radical enough. I mean, may maybe you're actually saying I'm not radical enough as well. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, but um, uh, what I, I, I said um, I, I, I published on the internet about critical psychiatry, and when I first started doing that, um, I actually called my website the anti-psychiatry uh, website, um, and that got me into uh, terrible trouble. I mean, I was uh, suspended for six months, and the Royal College um, sort of looked at my practice and uh, produced some report and said I needed to change. They didn't say how I needed to change, but uh, um, maybe the only thing I did change, though, was uh, change my name of my website from the anti-psychiatry website to the critical psychiatry website. So there is a, a sense in which uh, anti-psychiatry can be badly misunderstood and uh, um, but obviously I did choose that term um, so there is a sense in, in, in which I think it is a positive uh, use of language because psychiatry can make things worse for people and actually we ought to be against that um, and in that sense anti-psychiatry uh, has 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 is, is a useful term, um, but uh, I wanted to tie it in with what what you were saying, uh, Angela, because anti psychiatry is commonly seen as a sort of passing phase, which um, um, you know we we went through, and one way of looking at why it sort of fell out of the intellectual framework was because of post-structuralism, actually. So that um, anti-psychiatry uh, tended to be seen as, um, you know, an ideological uh, fuzzy thing uh, from the past, which actually we're a bit embarrassed about all this sort of liberal, uh, liberalizing, humanizing stuff. Um, and uh, the restatement of, of post-psychiatry of, of critical psychiatry has been possible because of this post psychiatry strand. So, um, although I, I, I'm not a postmodernist and uh, I, I wouldn't use the same language as Pat and Phil, um, I, I think adopting the postmodern framework and, and re expressing that in critical psychiatry has been helpful. I mean, I think just to say, I mean, I don't want to kind of I'm not sitting here playing the kind of Maoist from the anti-psychiatrist thing, <laughs> accusing people of not being radical enough. Um, so um, I was trying to think about, I mean, the larger thing was to think about what, it, what critique means. Mm -hmm. So what does critique mean? And that was, the attempt was, I think that um, Pat Bracken and Phil Thomas have tried to outline a concept of critique. They've done it quite lucidly. I was just disagreeing with it. Well, I wasn't, I mean, I'm not, it's not as about kind of pointing fingers. That was all I was kind of doing in those, that sense. I was just saying for me that maybe, and, and that we don't have, if we, we lose some kind of resources to resist power, if we construct power in the way that it's constructed, not only in their argument, but in other arguments and in a lot of critical work. 
Uh, that was, I mean, that's like a clarification of what I was Yeah, no, sure. And, um, and, and I can see what you're saying. Um, but I suppose it depends how you look at it, because uh, certainly the British strand of anti-psychiatry could be criticized for not really making any attempt to change psychiatry. Um, certainly uh, Cooper uh, and Lang, you know, were far more interested in uh, some sort of spiritual uh, solution to life's problems than really changing psychiatry. At least critical psychiatry has stayed within psychiatry and is trying to change it from, from within. And personally, I try to encourage uh, uh, a broader understanding of, of critical psychiatry and as you say that's a very broad range from people who want to abolish psychiatry completely I mean that's not me but I'm very happy to have that as part of the movement I commonly get criticized for saying you know what, what <laughs> with, uh, but, well particularly those who do want to abolish psychiatry they want to have nothing to do with critical psychiatry because but I think if, if critical psychiatry is going to be a movement, it's actually got to embrace the, the, the widest perspective. One question I have for both of you is how you see that, um, that those notions of critique um, within critical psychiatry, within empty psychiatry, linking to um, different forms of critique that, that it, uh, have been developed and championed by more explicitly sort of service user movements or mad pride movements or survivor movements. Um, you know, are, are these, there overlaps in these forms of critique or is there a sense of, of alliance and allegiance between these things or, or yeah, what's your sense of, of where, where those, those very powerful movements of the last kind of 30 years fit into an exchange between anti and critical psychiatry? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, clearly critique needs to be a matter of kind of political struggle in some ways, and that's what kind of the Italian experience and even the, and the French experience to a certain extent that we talked about yesterday was a matter of political struggle, and, and a lot of that political struggle has been done by the survivor movement and the service user movement in the UK and in America as well, so that kind of political struggle has been kind of that political struggle on the ground, and I, I mean... And there's connections between that kind of political struggle and critical psychiatry. And um, the question I was raising, and I suppose it's a question I don't know the answer to, and maybe other people have the answer to, is if 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 we think that part of the project of critique would be to negate psychiatric power, to think about how you might negate psychiatric power in all sorts of different ways. Yeah? And part of the talk again yesterday was the kind of creativity of kind of the Italian experience of doing different different kind of happenings to negate psychiatric power. How, how would we do this? What, what might be ways of kind of negating psychiatric power that, that didn't get co-opted because a lot, of, a lot of the language that's been developed and argued for and pushed forward gets co-opted? I mean, that's inevitable in a way, of course that's inevitable. But that, um, that would be kind of raising a question, and that's not a question that academics or professionals can determine or decide. It's just a question. I mean, this, the service user movement is a, is a broad church. Like I was saying, critical psychiatry mm. is a broad church. You, you, there's, there's no one service user movement as, as such. I mean, if you just use medication as an example, you know, there would be people within the service user movement who would be pro-medication, and there would be people who would be against medication, and they'd have very different views. So, uh, You've got to recognise the um, the diversity, really, of the mm. of the service user movement. I'm just interested in those logics of disavowal, though, about what you know that what what from the anti psychiatry movements plural were, were is seen in a contemporary sense in, in these precisely different contexts with different agendas and different very different values and beliefs in some cases. Um, what the kind of relationship to to the different aspects of anti psychiatry might be, um, that certainly dimensions of its critical project might, might be seen as enormously energising and, and kind of an inspiration in some levels, but, but I wonder if there is, you know, and, and this again, as you've said, may just be a question of in different contexts the answer is, is going to be different, but, but senses where there is a, an uncomfortableness perhaps around some of the other things that, that anti-psychiatry lingers on in people's memories in relation to, so that the, the kind of I don't know that sort of mysticism or or that sense of it of it being 
a place that didn't recognise or fully grasp people's suffering. Um, obviously, that's not true across the board, but I was, I was thinking of the, um, that, that really quite poignant book, and the title escapes me, that, that goes back to some of the people from Kingsley Hall and follows them up. I'm not sure if anyone has seen it, but it's, um, it's a kind of re-engaging, and I think that's an interesting contemporary historical, it's happening in the last, in these couple of years, is really between Luke Fowler and, um, you know, and these various kind of re-engaging with, with schizoculture and the dialectics of liberation is, was going back to, to look at, at some of the people who lived in Kingsley Hall, kind of not as patients but as the not patients they were, um, to see how their lives had, had progressed, had, had changed and developed. Um, and yeah, I think the book seems to sort of question some of the, the kind of more utopian, romantic, kind of humanist thinking of that time, which I'm not sure if people might have a view on. Psychiatry's got a, a, a terrible history which it can't disown. Um, it's done some terrible things to people. Um, you can't disown that. So inevitably there is going to be an anti-psychiatry element. Mm. Was, um, something that we were talking about yesterday, maybe not in public, um, <laughs> <laughs> not very helpful, but to, to reiterate it was, was the extent to which the, the critique um, such as it exists, which is contentious within kind of psychiatric practice, to what extent does that um, also operate within within how kind of art is taught as a therapeutic practice, within that kind of sphere of training? What kind of models are in existence and are they um, still on the kind of, you know, basket weaving model? Or are there, is there a kind of real radicality being injected into that because I think that's what comes very much out of the Italian context as well and and, and looking at, at Piero Gelardi's involvement it was absolutely about his his role not as a, a kind of mm -hmm. clinical practitioner but as a creative facilitator as an art worker within that sense and I, I, I don't know myself so I guess it's a, a question for you guys and anyone else who might know but the extent to which a, a kind of critical attitude towards art practice um, within the teaching of art therapy to what, what extent that exists. We were, oh, sorry. But there's somebody who, do you know the answer, Simon? Oh. <laughs> oh. Thanks. Um, I can recommend that Disabled Avant Garde's a very interesting collaboration, which is tackles a lot of those things. Um, one of the things they discuss is uh, to do with access and the idea that access therefore means sort of idiocy or simplicity and um, there is a case of foregrounding yeah, exactly complexity in the case of these very complex issues and not confounding. So, so say the Mayor of London's Disability Festival which happens on the South Bank each year is very well funded and uh, there are disabled artists singing, dancing, celebrating and it's a spectacle of celebration and of inclusivity up to a point but it's totally prosaic, one-sided, there's no sense of criticality to it at all it's like here's a load of money, twirl a ribbon, you know there is no room for critique whatsoever and I think um, it's important to acknowledge those things definitely it's sort of the language of access can filter through into the kind of art that's expected of different groups and uh, I think that's an interesting one. I think there's an interesting, um, it's, it's maybe less directly art or certainly the plastic arts but the really strong contemporary focus in narrative and you know calls for narrative psychiatry, calls for you know certainly within the medical humanities and, and the practice of narrative medicine, the kind of drive towards um, the patient "Quote unquote story as being something that's that's absolutely kind of at the centre of new practices, and I think there are really interesting questions to be asked about what kind of stories are valued in those practices and contexts, and are they very particularly crafted sort of recovery stories conforming to a particular kind of genre? So you only need to juxtapose collections like Mad Pride." Um, which is a fantastic anthology which breaks the boundaries of even what counts as a story. It's full of visual art and poetry and, and things don't tend to fit neatly either into diagnostic categories or into narrative frames compared to other collections which, which I'm not saying don't play an important role either for their, their authors or their readers but, but certainly open up a space where there's a kind of narrative um, drive towards a kind of 
normative view of what counts as being tellable about experience. So it gets back in, I think, in a way, as, as you were just suggesting, to where is, is complexity and where are some of the, the messier aspects mm. of, of experience, whether it's in the context of, you know, of psychosis or mental distress, not that these can be sharply divided from other kinds of um, experiences or illness or whatever, um, but where is that room for complexity and how is art, in some senses, especially within our cultural context, equipped to, to kind of help people in, in that mode or in that mode of engagement? I think, I mean, maybe I, this is my opportunity to do my advertising that I've been tasked to do <laughs> and I'll get in trouble if I don't do it. So uh, just to advertise that there is this event on Saturday the 9th of March in the International Community Centre that starts at 2pm, which is to launch this volume called Madness Contested Power and Practice that some of the people who edited the volume are in the room here. And part of that is a soapbox for if people are invited to come along and share their views and their poetry and their music and their art. So uh, everybody's kind of welcome to come along to that event. Good intervention. I think that um, this lady in the second row was first. And then... <laughs> Woman. Um, I just wanted to get back to the thing about... Uh, is this, is this it's not on, is it? Okay. I want to go back to the point about um, art therapists. And um, it relates very much to the, the issues of power. And um, in the, I, I am involved in art therapy training. And uh, there is an essential problem. There are wonderful things going on in the community with artists and mental health. Um, and the, the essential difficulty with art therapists training is that it's very, very expensive and there aren't grants for it. Mm. And so you get a middle class elite a training as art therapists. I'm not saying they're not great, but there are middle class art therapists training other middle class art therapists to be middle, up, middle class, <laughs> predominantly white art therapists. Um, and those issues of power are bound to to keep going and keep going and keep going until we have a, until we have a community of people who can all pay into a slush fund to to train some other art therapists who aren't white nice white middle class art therapists. Um, well, that's my view anyway. So it's a, it's a distinctly um, or particularly, I should say, expensive form of training. And it is. You have to pay your fees. You have to pay your therapy. Yeah, you have, you to, have to, be to pay your supervision. Yeah. You have to be in a placement, which means that you can't earn a living. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. It's an absurd thing. And the other thing is that art therapists cost a lot of money in the NHS, so they're being gradually phased out and phased out. Derbyshire CAMs have none now, and Derbyshire have taken it out of the... the that um, art therapy is recommended as a treatment for children because it really works but it's been taken out even though it's in the nice guidelines it's been taken out of Derbyshire's CAMS plan their five-year plan and do they have doesn't a, exist they haven't got an art therapist in Derbyshire do they have anymore. A, a, a model that, that replaces that uh, no 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 <laughs> let, them, let them jump off bridges actually um, it's uh, yeah they've got a nurse-led service really yeah, with people who actually don't have that depth of experience um, and don't have the the understanding and the knowledge. Yeah, it's, it's criminal, really. I'm so angry about it. I'm being really selfish making a second comment, but um, um, just to come back to the importance of narrative and our stories, and our stories are political. Um, but what has happened, I was reading a very fascinating article um, which talked about disability porn and disability tourism and how our stories have actually become commodified and sucked in and are now used, if you like, paraded out again to, to show the success of the, um, the clinical model of recovery, which was actually taken from us anyway. Um, and that we must reclaim our stories and we must politicize them. Um, that it's, it's all we have really, you know, it, this is the essence of who we are. And um, I, I think um, we, we've looked and been gold because uh, the outer wrapping, the language of our emancipatory solutions has been kept while things have just got more rigidified, uh, sorry, more rigid and commodified. Um, 
So the notion of um, sort of consuming our stories almost, um, and and we as the sort of the passive vehicles for other people to get a vicarious thrill out of listening, you know, to our distress, um, it is something that that we need to. I suppose we claim, you know, my story is my story, and I don't want it to be a peep show for anyone else, but I do want you to engage with it in a very honest, realistic way and commit yourself to change. There's, some, um, there's a fantastic recent article precisely called Reclaiming Our Stories. Yeah, yeah it's, we're, we're talking about it with Helen Brake. Um, and an interesting, I think you raise a really interesting point, again, that I know Helen and her colleague Mark Creswell have talked about, about what happens when we see narratives not just as, as narratives or recovery narratives but actually see them as testimony in the very political sense that testimony calls one not to be as a, a passive reader or a consumer or an appreciate, appreciator but actually calls us to action. Um, and what does that mean in, in, in all sorts of contexts, be they um, clinical, academic and just in the general world. So I think, that, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, I just wanted to uh, say something about this um, point about the um, understandability of madness um, and the knowledgeability of madness. I, I think that perhaps we need to recognize the limits of that understandability and knowledgeability and especially if we try to uh, understand madness through rational discourse only. Um, I mean, I've, I have uh, lived experiences of distress and um, I think one of the most useful things that I read, and it wasn't about madness, it was about so somebody was describing the Holocaust and this woman said, uh, it's something before which speech dies and I think um, it can apply to to madness, to, to uh, experience of mental, mental distress. And so perhaps, uh, and I, I've recently I was trying to write an academic piece about mad knowledge and madness, and I found it very hard. Uh, somehow I was losing my voice, um, and that <laughs> links to actually having lost physically my voice when I was ill. And I found that perhaps through um, art, for example, um, coming here to, to the gallery and seeing um, pictures of Alfred Kubin, and I thought that perhaps that's these pictures were a lot more telling about madness compared to any any rational kind of discourse about or DSM categories. So I think, yeah, and, and going back to uh, listening to people's stories, um, I guess that's perhaps um, something that, yeah, we need to be doing. I think I'm losing my thread, but I just wanted to, uh, to say about the, the limits, perhaps, to understandability of, of madness. I think you made a really clear point, actually. Um, I think, I mean, I think one of the interesting things, and um, it's maybe a kind of difficult thing to think about, a kind of turn back to madness, and kind of Angela talked about, kind of turn away and then maybe a little turn back to kind of madness, and uh, in Duncan's talk it was about kind of understanding, but the difficulty of understanding is at some level the turn back to madness would be kind of positive in the sense that everything everything becomes normalized. So the, you know, madness can only be visible if it kind of represents itself in a celebrity or something. Or there's a big discourse around destigmatizing, which is about saying being mentally ill is the same about as being physically ill. Yes. So the whole process of kind of destigmatizing <laughs> is itself a kind of way of making madness invisible. But then there is the kind of problem of romanticizing. I mean, there is this kind of issue. So. Does, but I think you've kind of you know expressed that very kind of eloquently is that just the return to madness doesn't mean that, that it means to kind of dwell in that space of trying to understand without being able to understand and maybe that's about our own experience as well as some a professional trying mm -hmm. to understand we don't understand our own experience 
And that's a kind of radical act in a, in a society where everything is kind of transparent and positive and produced and mm. uh, managed. Yeah. So I, I think that's a very important point. Yeah. I, I totally agree with what you're saying, and I, I hope I didn't give the impression that I was promoting a kind of rationalism. There. I didn't. I wasn't wasn't doing that at all. And uh, of course, uh, our, our, our normal uh, behaviour isn't rational either. Um, and really, yeah, in a way, that was what part of what Lang was was saying. And uh, you know, was severely criticised for it. But uh, I'm, I'm not promoting a rational. I, I think you're absolutely right. We shouldn't be promoting a rationalism in that sense. And that tension is really there, even in Lang's divided self, where he goes to this extraordinary effort through a kind of existential phenomenological framework to try and you know, understand through a project of empathy, but then calls himself up on it and says, but there is this, this place that, that we can't go just as one person can't fully access another's experience. And it's, I mean, you've drawn attention really well to, I think, that, that sense of, of a, a not wanting to, to colonise experience, not wanting to sort of take something and, and make it conform to, I mean, rigours of academic kind of sense-making as, as even a, a hyper-rational kind of discourse that doesn't allow for so many of these things. And I think it's, I think there's, a, there's interesting ways in which there are all sorts of different um, areas concerned with this question of an understandability that can never be totalising and can never be whole and that is meaningless if it's outside of a, of a context of, of, of a relationship, that a perfect understanding of somebody that we might have a fantasy we think we have doesn't mean anything if it's just simply um, a kind of dry, rational, intellectual exercise, that it's about what one then does or how that then means something for the person who might see themselves as being understood. And that was, I mean, there was a kind of... That was a part of a kind of tradition in psychiatry, a tradition that's not there, which was around kind of phenomenological psychiatry. I mean, I mm. think Howard talked about, brief, mentioned briefly Minkowski, and kind of Minkowski famously kind of wrote a case study where he actually went and lived with somebody who thought the world was coming to an end, and to try and understand what this experience was like. Uh, and that, you know, you could never completely understand what that experience was like. but. That attempt to understand something which can't be understood is a kind of ethic for psychiatry, I would say. Yeah. And, and it's, it's been there in kind of psychiatry's history, but it's very much covered over. People have thought the world is going to come to an end um, and, 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 and not, not be mad thinking that, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Rationally. Yeah. I mean, people. People have actually believed the world's going to come to an end. You know, mm -hmm. Various. Um, hi. When I went to college, before I went to college, to an art college, I was told to read three set books. One was John Cage's Silence. One was R.D. Lang's Divided Self, and the other was Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. I'm an old guy. Um, as, a, as a youth going to an art college in 68, all those three books, which were really heavy reading, all made perfect sense. How do you get across, as academics, these what I find now are fairly complex ideas because of the language you're using. How do you get this across to a young, vibrant generation that really needs a kick up the arse? <laughs> Great question. And is that even the relevant question to academics? This is really not a moment to confess that I've just started my academic post in a research-only role and I don't actually teach. Um, but I think it's a, it's a really profound question. Um, I, you must have much I, better I, experience I, of this than I do. I, think, I mean, I think there are kind of ways I could give a kind of example of, I mean, I teach nursing students and one way of kind of one of the things that I talk to students about is kind of why people don't why people might not want to have anything to do with psychiatry but how how will you work with somebody who doesn't want to have anything to do with psychiatry 
And now when you do this, you hear a kind of whisper going around the room. People are whispering, community treatment order too. And so one of the ways of kind of getting that critical awareness is to kind of say, you know, this, this, why have you gone there straight away? And do you know that this is only relatively recent? And sometimes people don't, are not aware that it's kind of relatively recent. It's frightening, but it's so kind of institutionalized already that they're kind of getting this in practice. But to give people a kind of an awareness of you know, that why that might be an automatic place that they would go to and thinking about alternatives to that. I don't know if it really answers your question. I mean, in a way, that's a, an example of, you know, of a, of a, how that kind of power becomes institutionalized very rapidly in, in society and in, in people's thoughts and responses when it was only a kind of relatively recent thing. I, it's just one example. I don't know if it's a good example. I don't think uh, you're allowed to do that. In, I mean, I can say this because I'm not a university. Uh, part of the reason I'm not a university is because I actually think it is very difficult for people to express those critical liberal views within the university uh, set up currently because, uh, you know, what it focuses on now is getting enough uh, uh, people uh, through the research uh, excellence framework and uh, four-star people and three-star people. They're not really interested in developing uh, an intellectual debate uh, about society in the, way, in, in the way you were encouraged to do when you went to, to university. Uh, I think universities have lost their way. They, the, the, the whole emphasis on academic values needs to be restated. I think that, that it, it's possibly true. I, I wouldn't like to think it was exclusively true. But one of the things I was thinking before, when um, when you were asking the question about about kind of wellness, well-being, is how, as a you know, within academic context and as active researchers, which kind of applies to all of you really, um, how do you resist those agendas being precisely the things that govern what you do? and what is funded. I mean, certainly with, with well-being, it's something that's kind of leaked into all kinds of funding for activities. And is there a way of, of using the idea of, genuine idea of critique to try and um, take advantage of access to the, to the money mm. um, or access to the system of a university, whether you're a student or a staff, but still kind of resist and be conscious of the fact that it is an agenda that's, that has some kind of sinister underbelly to it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I mean, I think students see through this stuff just like people saw through this stuff before. I mean, I, I just showed my students the other day two training videos from kind of, of behavioral activation and they kind of fell about laughing at it, you know. They didn't, I didn't say anything to them, they just kind of looked at it. And these are the training videos that they're showing that they're, so, you know, because the training video was just about, you know, you need to do this activity and break your activities down there. The next, training, the next bit of the training video is on the phone, and the guy's going, I, I did the activities, but I'm exhausted now. I'm just absolutely knackered. And, and you know, the students thought it was very kind of humorous and funny and ridiculous and patronizing and, mm. and didn't engage with meaning. And I didn't say any of that to them, so they, they, they were kind of aware of that. Um, but at the same level, there is a kind of, you know, they've got to enter the world that, and they've got to have these skills to get into that. So there is that kind of dominance. You've got to prepare your students to have these skills, to go and try and get a job when they won't get a job, mm. and to sell themselves with these kind of competencies and to be this kind of practitioner that people want them to be. So, yeah, that's, that's difficult. <laughs> but as soon as you accept that uh, the, the principle that money should be motivating research, yeah. Then you, you, you're 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 hindering the possibilities of of, of critique, really, aren't you? Um, so I mean, that, that that's what needs to be be challenged, really. The whole the whole principle that research should be motivated by, you know, how many grants somebody can get. Um, you know, academic values are much wider than that. Yeah, I Although, that, I mean, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, um, speaking another one of Helen's <laughs> articles, recent articles, um, on this idea of the engaged academic and the extent to which 
you know, I think it is a really interesting series of questions. And, and working in this project on, on voice hearing, it's for us a kind of co constant ongoing conversation about what is, what is our role? What, what is traditionally seen as an academic researcher role and what is the role that, that we might imagine for ourselves or that we might try and build for ourselves that seeks to make more of a difference without then becoming a kind of colonisation of somebody's experience or being seen as, as kind of stepping outside of, of the kind of expertise that, that we have within these, these different contexts. So, I mean, I think... I don't think it's, it's possible, particularly in the time we have left, to fix hard and fast answers to this that are true in all times. But I think that certainly much more than is currently the case, being pressed to address those questions, not just once in some, oh, we have, you know, in the, in the general health world, you know, we have done patient consultation, that's fine. Or we have one tokenistic representative of this world, so therefore we've got all of that covered. Um, thinking beyond that in quite clear ways, but not stopping to be having a conversation about what it is that the work that we do does within contexts that aren't specifically the research excellence framework or the, the kind of academic world operating to its own ends. Um, there was a question over there a while ago, um, so that maybe I should let you go first. Um, I just wanted to ask Duncan, as a psychiatrist, what kind of things do you do in your practice with people that makes you like an anti-psychiatrist? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I could spend the whole evening uh, talking about that, but I mean, just to sort of try and distill it, um, I suppose I have a different attitude to diagnosis um, and a different attitude to treatment. So different attitude to diagnosis is I have a broader idea of diagnosis. I'm not interested in a single word diagnosis like most psychiatrists. Um, and treatment um, is obviously, um, you know, much more than uh, medication. Um, I do use medication. I can't get away from the fact that, uh, you know, medication is used in society, but I'm, I'm very, very skeptical about uh, the evidence base. Um, that's one difference between critical psychiatry and anti-psychiatry. We actually do engage with the uh, the evidence base, and uh, generally, the literature overstates the uh, the uh, the advantages of, of medication. Who's next? Yeah. Please. Um, I, I'm thinking in terms of babies being thrown out with barfles here. Actually, maybe, but interestingly enough, when I was at St Martin's, it was a st not that long ago. There was a strong tendency to uh, try and um, separate off those of us who were keen on entering careers of therapy post art degree, and uh, and in fact we were actively discouraged from seeking psychoanalytical uh, examination of our art. Very much so. Um, it, that was we weren't even allowed to raise the question actually, and we lost half our number. We had 40 mature students. Most of them were women, most of them had finally got a chance to do the degrees after their kids had left home, were leaving. By the time we got to year two, we had a 50% dropout rate because not all those people had, had entered because they wanted to use their arts, if you like, towards, as they saw it, helping society. And they were actively discouraged from doing so, I can say that. The other thing is that, um, do you see there's a parallel? I think of, I mean, most of the people I've read have been Alice Miller and Vassal. I mean, I've been more on the psychoanalytical side myself. Um, do you think there's a parallel between, um, I noticed, for example, um, Alistair mentioned something about psychoanalysis towards the end of uh, your, your presentation. Uh, do you think there's been a parallel between a more critical attitude to psychotherapy which has been parallel, which is paralleling this anti-psychiatric tendency, perhaps, if I could put it in a clumsy way. Do you think there's been a spin-off from that? Because at one time, of course, um, and the, the, the debates used to be had in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you'd get a psychiatrist versus a psychotherapist on TV, you know, debating. <laughs> no, it was, as, it, was as, it was as, you know, as obvious as that, you know, in terms of, in terms of there being a better way instead of using drugs. 
Uh, I myself entered psychotherapy because um, I was offered a, a drug therapy and I decided it was too controlling. I just, I didn't know about it, but I knew enough to feel that in a gut reaction I didn't want that. Um, anyway, just some comments. I mean, I, I think in terms of the links between psychoanalysis and anti-psychiatry, then that's a kind of symposium in itself. I mean, certainly there's a kind of, I mean, David would be able to talk about it better than me, but in the kind of French context, there's a significant kind of influence from Lacan and that kind of strand of psychoanalysis. I mean, psychoanalysis, some level kind of influenced Lang, although his kind of use of those concepts was very kind of heterodox. Um, maybe that's a good thing. Um, I, I mean, I, mine was just a kind of gesture, a sort of gesture towards the idea that part of what constitutes a plural tradition of psychiatry is psychoanalysis. Um, I mean, okay, there were splits there, but even if you look at the formation of the schizophrenia concept with Bloehler, I mean, it couldn't have been formed without kind of Freud and some of those concepts and ideas. Mm -hmm. So there's an interesting kind of mix there uh, uh, that maybe is a tension. And, okay, psychoanalysis is problematic, but it's, it's kind of pushed out of the cultural scene. It's not talked about. And part of the reason I was saying it's not talked about is maybe this idea that we it's difficult to deal with aspects of ourself that are kind of hidden from us in a very kind of positivist culture where we're all focusing on changing our thoughts to change our reality, as if thoughts were like that. Would it be correct to that there's a kind of been in a similar sense that's been emphasis of a kind of reliance on drugs, that there's a reliance on very efficient forms of a therapeutic process like CBT and its variants where it's absolutely not really about experience it's about a quite you know a very rational programmatic way of doing just getting it. back to work about yeah, getting back to work, to work. <laughs> um, Frank you're first and then this lady there and uh, that might be it we've probably got time for you two and then one more and then we'll have to call it night I wonder whether one of the reasons why the point made down there about certain quite complex texts in the 60s were um, quite sort of absorbed and by people um, might relate to the fact that within popular culture, particularly cinema, the, um, the kind of narrative of, of psycho, uh, psychology and um, psychoanalysis had been very much incorporated into the films of the 40s. 50s and 60s, and whether there's a kind of sense of a sort of um, an anti-psychiatry sort of sense within um, within the popular cultural films of that time, which laid the basis for some of the more um, radical political um, kind of narratives being understood in a wider way than the simple sort of academic community. And I wonder whether the um, current popular culture gives help or hindrance to having this debate understood now. I think that's a really good point. I think there's also um, an interesting point about what other texts that were read at that time are not being read and, and kind of in some ways feminist texts are another key example, um, a kind of broad one of the, the, the malaise of the youth of today is this idea of the post-political that people aren't, aren't engaging in quite the same way and, and, and clearly there's got to be a link to, to popular culture and to the kinds of things that people are much more interested in engaging with. Um, but it, it, it's a really interesting notion to think about where, where cinema fits in and visual cultures fit in to that kind of you know, anti-psychiatric zeitgeist that did include um, you know, a whole lot of, I think it was Cedric calling them the, the liberal arts and social science reading public which I don't know exists in quite the same way, um, certainly not among young people today. I, don't, I mean, I, I like kind of the rest of the Guardian reading population. I've been kind of watching Borgen on a Saturday night, and <laughs> there was an interesting little kind of psychiatric story in Borgen, and uh, one of the things that the Prime Minister was, she was like represented as a kind of remnant of the anti-psychiatrist anti because she didn't want her daughter medicated. And then she had to kind of learn to accept that her daughter really needed this medication. Uh, she did go to a, quite a nice psychiatric private facility, and there was there was lots of good some group work and stuff going on there. It was kind of CBT-ish, but 
was a kind of interesting right. cultural representation that's like, quite different from Ken Loach and family life. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 agree, I agree with all, all, all that, except the last two evenings we've seen two recent films, um, and uh, the one today was by, by Luke Fowler, and he's produced an even more recent film on R.D. Lang, which was uh, up for the Turner Prize. So, I know, is that a sign that we should be hopeful about what's happening? Well, I, I was wondering whether, um, sort of, as psychoanalysis was the sort of metaphor, uh, not psychoanalysis, but um, schizophrenia was a, a kind of meta, a, a handy metaphor for the period of the 60s, whether something like Tourette's seems to have become, in popular culture, very much a sort of, um, a kind of metaphor in the sense that, um, you know, we don't, on Big Brother and constantly being dealt with in, in, in um, re reality TV programs and that. This game, the kind of paradigmatic illness of our time, what's the, <laughs> you know, what's the, what's the paradigmatic illness of the early 21st century? But I do think a case could be made for schizophrenia and that kind of Angela makes. The case in her book, you know, very well, that in some ways this is the kind of, that Angela talks about is the sublime object. and. And I, I mean, Foucault wrote this piece called uh, Madness, the Absence of Work, where he kind of says, you know, there'll be a time when madness disappears. But our fascination with madness will be kind of gone. And I don't know whether the kind of cultural representation of madness, you know, this idea that it can just be treated or that it's, it isn't, that there isn't any deep meaning to it. Um, and maybe there'll be a kind of reaction against that. Maybe what Duncan is saying is that there's this kind of, from the artistic community, there's this is a kind of reaction against this idea that, you know, there, maybe there is some kind of meaning there. And maybe there is something interesting in that experience that can't be easily represented or easily captured or easily normalized. So there's a line in the <laughs> People are just stoned with different things, ecstasy. Yeah. So. Adderall. Um, I want to thank you for a fantastic two evenings. Um, I may have missed the moment, but in the conversation about psychotherapy and the questioning of power and the legacy of the 60s, just wanted to put a plug for the Philadelphia Association in London, which is alive and kicking, <laughs> and I trained there. And um, so a lot of these questions are still very much current and being debated in psychotherapy trainings, and rightly so, so, so that um, the questions about power and how to teach psychotherapy and what it means to be a psychotherapist. There's a lot of parallel, although it's not specifically a medical training, um, but there's questions of power. Um, thank you. I think um, two more questions. So, Helen. Um, Hi, yeah, yeah, just just a, a few points really. I think um, one on the question of a return to madness. I think um, I, I think we should have a return to madness in a way, but not not in the sense of seeking to um, explain or understand it as the sort of Foucauldian cr critique outlines, but more in terms of actually that re that return to experience. Because I think that with the recovery agenda and the wellness agenda and everything else that people are talking about, that I think that's all about not listening to madness anymore. Um, and I think there is a disavowal of madness, actually, um, in all the sort of treatment modalities and everything. is all about not really listening to suffering and, and, and madness. And I think what, what I wanted to say was that I think there's a... a we talk about anti-psychiatry and its legacies. I think there are a lot of legacies still around. The Philadelphia Association is one of them. The Satiria Network is another. Mm. Um, the work of Laura Moshe. And Asylum Magazine as well that, that, that I'm involved in. I have, to get, I have to get a plug in as well. Thank you. <laughs> and Asylum Magazine is very much the, uh, one of, I think, a key legacy of the anti-psychiatry movement. It was set up by a radical psychiatrist that Duncan used to work with, Alec Jenner, who, who went... I visited lots of the, these organizations, Trieste, the SPK, 
all these places and came back and tried to what he wanted to do really, and he was quite a traditional psychiatrist, but what he, he wanted to do was to have a debate with madness and, and put madness on the table to say, look, let's give it its own voice. Let's not try and, you know, treat or understand it. We don't understand it, so let's give it a proper place at the table. Um, and I think that's what things like Asylum Magazine are, are all about, to, um, to do that, to, to present madness in its raw experience to not try and it's not like an academic article that, that sort of categorizes things it's not a therapeutic journal that seeks to treatment it just kind of is tries to have a, a, a raw debate about a madness between workers between survivors service users and have a and have that pl proliferation of uh, of different ideas and I think um, and, and in that sense I, I in terms of resistance I think things like um, John Holloway's work on crack capitalism is really interesting and often it's people who are not in academia that are writing this good stuff actually and he talks about multiple cracks in capitalism of, of, of negation and creation of something different um, and there are lots of examples of that that, that are direct legacies of anti-psychiatry like the Philadelphia Association, like Asylum Magazine but also other things that have come up in its wake like the Hearing Voices Network or the Paranoia Network stuff around self-harm, there's lots of different things out there that are different cracks and perhaps it's, the question is how do we link those cracks Thank you, um, um, uh, Helen's also left some, we've put some of the, the leaflets with our other literature so if anyone doesn't know the magazine and wants to find out more then can pick one up. I think um, it's going to have to be the last question. Um, gentleman at the back, you asked the first question. <laughs> I'm not wrong. Um, yeah, for, firstly I just wanted to thank um, for the day. I think it's been really um, interesting and helpful and uh, useful. I suppose for me, uh, is it, uh, I class myself as a questioning psychologist. I suppose my personal experience at the moment though is that biological cognitive reductionism is getting a stronger and stronger grip. Kind of bureaucracy within health services is crushing for all professionals, creative or not. Um, and inequality is increasing um, beyond the doors of psychiatry and part of me I just kind of um, wonder about the ways forward it's a very big question um, they could be in small ways but and part of it is for me is where how do we stop this tide not even turning it around but how do we stop it getting even worse because my sense is it, it's got a it's got a grip at the moment and I'm I'm keen and interested to know where do we go? And I share the ideas from Asylum in terms of it needs some joining up um, of different groups because actually I think we're far stronger if we kind of um, pull together uh, rather than argue amongst ourselves really. Big question but um, I suppose it's pointing to the future really. I think you've answered it for yourself. <laughs> there needs to be a, 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 a broad, broad uh, church, really, doesn't there? And, and a joining up of, uh, of groups. Uh, there does need to. I, I think you're, you're you're right. There is a sense in which there's a, a tightening of a of, of, of a of a positive approach, and that that just needs to be challenged, and it needs to be challenged by as wide a group as possible. I mean, I don't know whether. I mean, one of the things about kind of recent. I mean, the recent years has been a kind of a massive kind of growth in political activism. I mean, I think it would be wrong to kind of sit, sit here and to say that, you know, young people are a post-political generation. They've kind of disproved that, you know, kind of out and struggling and kind of occupying movements and things like that. And I suppose one of the questions would be, you know, how, do, how does critical psychiatry, anti-psychiatry take its place amongst the wider radical movement that it had? Um, you know, that it was kind of central. Uh, how does it kind of take its place amongst that kind of wider anti-capitalist, anti-globalization struggle? That would be a, a question I don't have an answer to. Answer? 
I think clearly, could, I think your point, Alistair, before about not just mapping power and doing a conscientious job of understanding the pernicious effects of bureaucracy through to the kind of operation of the produ production of you know molecular cells, not just mapping those things, but actually advancing the critique or connecting up the critique is is a really important thing to hold on to. I don't, I don't, I think there are there are deep and pernicious strands of of post the post political out there, and maybe um, haven't got as, as in depth an appreciation of the the Occupy movements, but but it's a it's again another small and perhaps pathetically academic response to say that in part it, it is about building the evidence base and as much as is possible kind of finding the ways this, this isn't quite critique and it's not quite sort of taking a radical agenda but it is perhaps a small step in alliance with those things or at least not one encounter to those things to suggest that that actually being able to, to speak in ways that do influence nice guidelines, that do show that, that, that things like the Sotaria Network make sense and are effective by all the measures of the people for whom those, those things count. And, and yeah, providing a way to speak back in the kind of co-opted language that we've all been dominated in, there's definitely a role for that. There's a role to press gang researchers into doing that and doing that more vigorously and, and with better funding and, you know, it's a bit of a daggy answer, but it, I think it, it's going to play a role. It has to somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, I think we're going to have to draw things to a close because uh, we're you know, just straying slightly over our schedule finishing time. Um, but uh, thank you very much um, yesterday to, to David, um, John, and, and Howard, um, today uh, for Alistair, Angela, and, and Duncan. And um, thank you very much also for being a very uh, committed and present audience. And I shall be expecting to hear more from you. Um, if you do have any other um, reactions or responses to the event once you've left the room, as happens, then um, then please feel like uh, you can you can get in touch with me, or if you want to get in touch via with me with any of the speakers, or or kind of you know ask for any information about what they discussed on both days. The recordings will be online um, fairly shortly, within you know a few days. But if there is anything specific you want to follow up, then um, my email is on, um, oh, it's there. Um, it's also on the website, but um, just feel happy to get in touch. Um, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.